Hey cousins, I'm Shamaya. It's like papaya, except it's not, and this is plot twist, please. Let's get into it. What a feeling. Beings believing. I can have it all, now I'm dancing for my life. Okay, dramatic much? Said the autistic professional actor who cries every time she watches Finding Nemo. And a side note, what a perfect movie. What a perfect movie. Keep swimming. It's just, he learns to trust himself and then his dad learns to trust him and it's... <clears throat> Take two. Most people would listen to those Irene Cara lyrics and be like, girl, dancing for your life? For your life? Is it that serious? Well, my neurodivergent heart says yes. And thank you, Flashdance, for putting this song on my radar because it led me to what we're chatting about today. Having no chill. If you're someone who says, well, we're all on the spectrum somewhere, I have a question for you. No judgment, just a question. Have you ever had an autistic meltdown that ruined your day? But before we get into it, let's make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and go ahead and leave a comment if you're new here. We love having you around. New episodes typically go up Thursdays, Fridays, and Sundays, so let's hang out. When you're autistic, that's formally known as a person with autism spectrum disorder, colloquially known as an auti, that's the word auntie, sans the letter N, so auti, you know, just a cute little, <laughs> just a cute little thing. If you're autistic, you tend to feel a lot of things all of the time. To be more specific, there's this thing called, and brace yourself, because it's a big word, alexithymia. It makes it difficult for us to know what we're feeling and or regulate our feelings. Emphasis on the word chub. You know, we're not all the same. You've been here before, you get it, you get it. You meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, yada, 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 a partridge in a bear tree. But basically, imagine your emotions are tiny little bouncy balls just bouncing around and being able to catch them is something you are naturally able to do. You catch them left and right below, you know, underneath the leg, over, you, you, you just are catching them all. You can maybe do a dive, you can crouch, you can run, you can kneel, you're able to, do, able to do all those things in order to catch these little bouncy balls on the loose. Now, imagine you're only allowed to catch those balls with your toes. That's what alexithymia is like. Of course, this is an oversimplification for the sake of visual representation, but oh, that was kind of like a little Dr. Seuss rhyme. Okay, Dr. Seuss, uh, but more or less, emotions can be hard to identify for us. I don't think I'm one of the oddies with alexithymia, but I would say I'm an alexithymia adjacent person. Let me explain. I know when I'm excited, and probably so can everyone else that I'm around at that moment. I know when I'm happy, but sadness and anger are more difficult for me to internalize. Now, caveat, caveat, I do wonder if being socialized as a woman has anything to do with that, right? You feel? Because... Because the girlies, the girlies know. As a woman and as a black woman, I know, big shocker, I'm black. I'm black. Sorry if that was a shocker to you, jump scare. I don't wanna, you know, don't wanna scare, don't wanna scare you. Um, I have been socialized to only show, I'm black. I'm um, sorry, just had to do it one more time. I have been socialized to only show joy and happiness. And a lot of women are. Like we're not allowed to be sad or angry because that's not pleasant. So who cares if you're in your second trimester? Be pleasant. You just worked a double shift, grocery prices are skyrocketing, your rent just went up, and you did not get a raise, and your doctor isn't listening to you, but have you tried smiling? So yeah, there is a part of me that's like, maybe I never felt like I was allowed to be angry and or sad, so when I actually was angry and or sad, my brain kind of went, can't compute, can't compute. Also, you're not sad. Like that's what my brain would kind of like, I would kind of think to myself, no, you're not sad. You just need a nap. You just want a cupcake. You're not angry. You just are confused. You don't actually see what's going on. You need more information. You don't have a full scope of what's happening in front of you. You're not angry. There's no injustice here. You just are confused. Mind you, I'm pretty sure I will always be the kind of person, you know, I think, to look at the data and get several distinct opinions from different kinds of people, from people in different walks of my life, from people from different circles in my life before I react to a particular situation, especially if that situation seems like it has a lot of potential consequences. But like that's just me, myself, and my over-analytical techniques at work, honey. And those techniques do not take a day off. But essentially, I think as a woman, I'm used to being told to hold my peace, to be chill, to be someone else's peace, right? And at a certain point, you can't be chill. You can't. You just can't. <laughs> Psychologists might call this unmasking what I'm talking about here, but I'm calling it losing my chill. All right, Educator Shamaya is visiting for a short second, just, you know, just 
I'm gonna put on my little blazer here. The handy blazer just over here. Wow. No, this is this transition is taking longer than I thought it was going to. This was a bit, but now it's just becoming an entire saga. The bit has lasted for far too long already. Okay, you know what? This is what it is. Hi. All right, Educator Shamaya here. I finally made it. I was being held up but by some students, um, but we're here. So if you're new here, autistic people do this thing called masking to keep ourselves safe in social situations, in environments particularly that we may not be familiar with or where we feel like there's great risk of committing a social faux pas. Masking can involve laughing when we don't think a joke is actually funny or smiling when we're not actually happy because we don't want to disrupt the social script in our environment. Now unmasking is deciding in that particular instance not to do that also you, you can unmask for a long period of time you can unmask for days on end or you can unmask just for a moment and then be like oop my mask is slipping gotta put it back up and it really can depend on the type of people you're around or how tired you are that day because masking can be exhausting okay Bye, Educator Shamaya. Oh my God, gotta take the blazer. Okay, when Shamaya is back. Being chill for us oddies often means to mask. But could non-autistic people have a point? Could they have a point when it comes to having a chill, being chill? Could there be, dare I say, a middle ground? Mm. Don't stuff me in a locker yet. What I do think that non-autistic people are getting at is the notion of emotional regulation. So let me know and you can be honest with me. You can be honest over here if this sounds like you. You used to express a full range of emotions or maybe you don't even remember far enough to recall a time like that. Me, we're talking about me. But at some point, you learned that it was more acceptable to be pleasant than to feel. Now I want you to walk even further down that street of memory lane and we're gonna talk about fictional characters. Oh yeah, using fictional characters to describe phenomenons in real life. This is the thing I like to do. So what I'm going to do now, since we are all on memory lane together, is introduce three fictional characters that I think are really good examples of how autistic people can navigate emotional regulation. The first character we're talking about today is Giselle from Ella Enchanted. No, no, not Ella Enchanted. Enchanted. Ella Enchanted is with Anne Hathaway. Enchanted is with Amy Adams. Two iconic women uh, who are separate entities and both deserving of their flowers. So Giselle from Enchanted, Junie B. Jones, and Eloise from Bridgerton. Now disclaimer, to me these people are autistic coded. Don't come down my throat. To me they're autistic coded. Don't come from my neck. Meaning whether intentional or not, they can be interpreted as representations of autistic people. They can also have experiences that mirror those of autistic people who actually exist in real life and or they can have qualities that intentionally or unintentionally mirror autistic qualities. So I'm not gonna get into whether or not autistic coded characters are valid. If you feel seen as an autistic person, when you identify a character as autistic coded, then I feel like that's all that matters. Fight me, fight me on it, except don't because I'll probably cry. First. Giselle from Enchanted. I'm really excited to talk about Giselle because I think she goes against a lot of autistic person stereotypes. She's not a doctor, she's not a scientist, she's not a detective, she's not a man, and she's very hyper feminine. You know, most stereotypical interpretations of autistic people would make you think that we don't feel empathy, have that we generally have a deadpan or monotone way of speaking, and or that we're, we're only interested in math and science. But no, no, my liege. Giselle is the furthest thing from that stereotype. And I love it. I love it. Giselle, played by Amy Adams, is very tapped into her emotions, spends an enormous amount of energy trying to help the people she cares about, or, you know, animals, because animal, animal. She cares about and is very social. Rather than crouched over a chess game, you'd find her dancing and singing. And I think this also illustrates to us autistic women or people socialized as women that it's all right to be a girly girl and still be on the spectrum. And to me, a girly girl on the spectrum, I see a lot of autistic traits in that character. Even though within the context of the movie, she seems to acquire these traits as a byproduct of being born in a fictional cartoon fairy tale world, she embodies the fish out of water persona that a lot of autistic people might be able to relate to. You know, she definitely falls into that trope of being manic pixie dream girl by the people around her, even though she is a fully fledged human being with a full spectrum of emotion. Because autistic people in the real world are fish out of water. You know, we're jellyfish in a fresh freshwater pond. 
Okay, that's not necessarily a fish out of water metaphor because the jellyfish is still in water, but it's not the kind of water it typically calls home. So just leave me alone. It works. Giselle is an example of someone who has to experience emotional regulation throughout the film. And we watch it happen in real time. We watch her start to understand the different colors of emotion. When she experiences anger for the first time, she can barely conceptualize that it is anger. And in my case, as a you know real human person who was in a cartoon, anger and disappointment were emotions that I realized were signs of perceived injustice. So when I was angry, it was often because I didn't think something was fair. I, and I eventually had to learn how to allow myself to feel that emotion in a way that was still respectful of others. I think what we can learn from Giselle is that it's okay to display a full range of emotion rather than just pure joy. And it's also okay to be stumbling throughout finding that balance. And she does. Next up, Junie B. Jones. Did y'all know she was autistic coded? Because I didn't until preparing for this episode and my eyes are open. I love this character as an example because if you remember the books or if you're privy to this, you know, stage version of the stories, yes, Junie B. Jones did turn into a TYA musical, several. She is an elementary school student who had to deal with many trials of growing up and feels every emotion thoroughly. When she's upset, you know it. When she's excited, you'll hear about it. And Though her behavior might be consistent with how ADHD can manifest in some people, she also could be interpreted as an emotionally aware autistic person who doesn't try to mask at all. At least that's my neurodivergent opinion. And she's a kid who grows up in a household that, as far as the audience can see, you know, just using context clues, didn't pressure her to mask. Even though Junie B. Jones is an elementary school icon, yes, those children, children's books were the moment, she was that girl. I think she can show adults too how important it is to allow yourself to feel your emotions, to journal them, and to talk to people about them. Also, Junie B. Jones is a testament to her parents because they not only let her feel the full breadth of her emotions, but they gave her tools to solve her own problems rather than trying to bulldoze them and solve them for her. This. I think is an extremely useful skill for an autistic child who will later be an autistic adult who will also have intense and probably more complex emotions. Well, no, no, kids have complex emotions. I think adults just have complex ways of conceptualizing them. And I know this part right here is gonna sound really meta, but buckle up. If you don't give your feelings a place to go, if you don't target them in a specific direction, they will do it on their own. Yes, they will. Life be life and sometimes, all right? It'll hit you like a brick wall. But Junie B teaches us flexibility when it comes to big changes. Oh yeah, definitely autistic coded, 100%. All, all of her emotional crises have to do with change. In, in all of the books, I think, I, I used to teach preschool, so like I'm, I'm, very, I'm very in the know about these children's books, okay? But in every single one of the books, her biggest struggle, the biggest conflict is that she's experiencing change whether it's her moving to a new school or her going to a different grade, moving up to a different grade of school or, or the friends who were her close friends moving on to other friend groups or her herself changing her wants, things, things that people experience regardless of age. So yeah, very autistic coded. Change being the biggest struggle, very autistic coded. Mm -hmm. One plus one equals two. It just does. The last fictional character we'll talk about today is Eloise Bridgerton. Yeah, Bridgertonites, I see you. We're here, we're here. Eloise has quickly become a fan favorite and for good reason. Eloise is ahead of her time. The reason I think she's autistic coded is because she seems either unaware of how her lack of attachment to social conventions can negatively impact her life in the time period she's in, or she doesn't care. When it comes to her big scandal, you know, I guess that's an exception, but generally she doesn't care about doing things the way they've always been done for the sake of tradition. It's just not a good enough reason for her. And that's a very autistic way of thinking, um, just in general. Not saying that everyone who thinks unconventionally is autistic or autistic coded, but it is, it is something that I find who inter someone as someone who interacts with a lot of autistic people who has autistic friends and who is autistic myself, that is something that I find consistent across the board. There, there are just ways that we live life where we're like, it, even in small decisions, like the clothes we wear or the, the ideologies we subscribe to, like if, if it just seems like it's the way it is and that's the only reason, then we don't tend to buy in. Cause why, why? 
I also just find that autistic people a lot of the time need an explanation as to why to do something. Um, there, there's that demand avoidance, if you know about that. Um, we tend to avoid doing what we're told <laughs> purely because someone told us to do it. Um, unless someone gives us a valid reason. Side note, I also feel like the fact that this type of character exists in this time period in the show reminds us that Bridgerton is in fact fiction. Because I'm no historian, right? But I'm pretty sure a woman in that era wouldn't be able to get away with it. I just... Now, I mean, listen, Eloise is a Bridgerton and she's rich, so I don't know. But any historians comment below if this is an accurate assumption or not. But, 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 she is a fresh reminder that autistic anger, frustration, and frankly, indifference even is valid. While her society tells her she needs to be demure, quiet, and poised, she's always completely herself. She speaks the truth and is honest even when it's not what people want to hear. Even if we, in our circumstances, you know, you and me can't be as carefree and outspoken as Eloise, because let's be real, we have jobs and many of us are not heiresses or duchesses. She shows us that we are allowed to prioritize the things that we care about. And we are allowed to pursue our dreams, our passions, and our bliss, even if the way that we get there is by losing our chill. Remember when I talked about my difficulty expressing anger or disappointment? Well, here's a short list of what showing anger or disappointment has gotten me. A discount, admission into an amusement park, deeper relationships with friends, and a better understanding of my limitations and my needs. And you know, my overall self, which is which is nice, which is kind of kind of a sweet deal. So the next time you feel like getting up and dancing for your life, that's a callback to the beginning of this episode if you you know, we, we love a literary device. We love a literary device. Yum. Know that you are doing what you need to do. Screaming into a pillow, rip, ripping up a notebook, crying on the bus. Sometimes you just gotta do it. Because cause listen, if you don't dance for your life, no one is gonna do it for you. That's all I have. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. Share this with a buddy. You know, share this with someone who you think it would be meaningful to. Be blessed and stay weird. Also, introduction to my walk-in closet. Hello. Just trying to get better audio, trying to get better visuals here. So stick around.